know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. Thomas Jefferson. Uh, our speaker, uh, Claudine Schneider, will easily recognize uh, this quote because I pilfered it from her email signature. What a great quote indeed. Uh, first and foremost, she is the first and only woman to ever be elected to the U.S. Congress from Rhode Island and the first Republican since the 1940s. She served five terms from 1980 to 1990 in which she introduced the first and only revenue-neutral Global Warming Prevention Act, garnering 140 bipartisan co-sponsors and proved an ardent proponent of environmental issues. She continued that calling after her time in Congress, including a stint at Harvard's Kennedy School. Uh, she founded uh, a renewable energy and energy efficiency company in Costa Rica, which demonstrated the economic benefits of addressing climate and other endeavors. And I should uh, point out that Costa Rica is now a 100% renewable energy country, the first of its kind, and its initiatives, like Claudine Schneider's company, that brought uh, this um, movement development uh, on its way. Um, you have to start somewhere, and she did. So now that she's in Colorado, uh, she tells me she picked that spot um, uh, not necessarily for the mountains, although that is probably a very good motive, but also to be nearer to uh, those scientists uh, at NOAA, NCAR, UCAR, and NREL, um, with whom she had worked uh, in the past. She remains committed to climate solutions and on that front enlisted 50 Fortune 500 co uh, corporations as climate leaders. She became an advisor to the board of National Grid and was honored for her work with numerous climate awards, for instance, from the Climate Institute. She serves on the boards of the Cl Citizens Climate Lobby, which, by the way, meets here at Jefferson Unitarian uh, on first Saturdays of the month. And Phil Nelson, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, is uh, the organizer for that. Uh, tonight, uh, Claudine Schneider will make the Republican case for action on climate. So please help me welcome Claudine Schneider. All right. Hello, everybody. And <laughs> please, making the Republican case for climate, somehow or other. Um, so here's the case. Vote Democrat. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. Um, and I am serious. So initially, I was asked to um, just give a little bit of insight as to how I got into my focus on climate and what that looked like, et cetera. And Martin did do some of that introduction. And so I want to share with you more politics than climate. But I want to start a little bit by why did I ever run for Congress? <laughs> because no doubt, after I speak some more, I'm sure you'll, that question will be on your mind. But I so I will say that when I was 25 years old and very excited because I was just about to get married and move to the state of Rhode Island, I suddenly was informed that I had cancer of the lymph system. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I can't possibly die yet. And the prognosis was, you have a 50-50 chance of living and or dying. And I thought, you know, my parents always taught me that if, that, that everybody on this earth has a purpose. And I was thinking, you know, I can't possibly die. I haven't fulfilled any purposes yet. It's probably appropriate that I be speaking here in a church about this because then I started every morning, afternoon, and evening. What is my purpose? Why am I on this earth? What is it that, that I am to do here? Because 
I can't possibly die without having done something. And um, I kept asking that question, and the next thing I know is that they wanted to build a nuclear power plant down the road from us. And I thought, wait a minute, I just moved to New England. I thought this is where they did town meetings and ask people, well, what's your opinion? What do you want in your community? Isn't that what democracy is all about? So put a pin in that note because I'm also very concerned about the whole fracking issue, the impact on climate, the impact of having town meetings and letting the public voice be heard. And Martin had read the Thomas Jefferson quote that I have on my signature page, and I feel very strongly about this, that we need to lift our voices and be heard on no matter what issue it is. It's incumbent upon us to be part of the solution. If we're not, we're part of the problem. There is no middle ground. So if you're sitting home and just thinking, oh, I've had enough of all this, or I'm exhausted, or whatever, you're part of the problem. And we need to keep that in mind. So at any rate, long story short, my husband, new husband came home one day, he said, and he was the director of um, the EPA laboratory at, um, in Narragansett for ocean pollution. So married to an oceanographer, to a scientist, and I was pretty excited um, when I got to Congress, well, first of all, before I got there, he was the one who said, I think I'd like to run for governor. And I said, oh, well, great. I'll help organize the volunteers, and I'll help you raise money, and if that's what you want to do, love, let's go do it. And then he got cold feet, and he said, you should do it. And I said, no, wait a minute, I hate politics, I'm not interested. And he said, well, no, you are very interested in what goes on in the world. And I had studied languages because I intended to enter the foreign service to build bridges of understanding among all nations. And so I feel very strongly about where we are right now, as you could possibly imagine. And so at any rate, I just laughed off his suggestion that I should run. But then not too much later, uh, this woman who lived down the road from us, who didn't really know me that well, she said, you know, I think you'd be great in Congress. And it's like, what? You don't even know me. And then a third person came along, and I thought, wow. So it's not like, um, well, I should say, when we arrived in Rhode Island, it was tremendously democratic, and it was tremendously corrupt. And we decided, whatever those guys are, we're going to be the opposite. So we registered as Republicans. You know, the party of Teddy Roosevelt, the party of Abraham Lincoln. How could that be so bad? Well, um, we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, um, I ran. And the first time, I got 48% of the vote, and everybody said, oh my god, who is this? woman and how did she get that close to winning? So then I ran a second time and I won. And I served on the Science Research and Technology Committee for 10 years. And during those 10 years, I kept hearing the scientists from NCAR and NREL and NOAA come forward and say, we've got a problem. And the more details I heard, the more I thought, I'm in a position of responsibility here, and I have power to actually do something. So even if these scientists, who were honestly equivocating at that time, they were presenting the facts, but it wasn't so compelling that it made me jump up in 1982 and do something about it, but it did take quite a while to pull together the best and the brightest who could help with the solutions. So we got some of the farmers from all around the country to look at what they could do. And what was the climate approach that 
farmers ought to take. And we got the auto manufacturers together and discussed about what was possible. Fortunately, we also had jurisdiction over the national labs, and Lawrence Berkeley and other labs were telling us, well, you know, we could be so much more efficient with our automobiles, with our appliances, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, okay, let's, let's do this. So the legislation, the Global Warming Prevention Act, was an omnibus bill, basically to educate my colleagues, the American people, but everybody to understand there is no silver bullet to climate change, that it requires that every sector of our economy be engaged, all hands on deck, ASAP. So, um, some of the provisions of the bill pass. For example, if any of you go to buy a refrigerator or a TV set and you see an Energy Star rating on there, well, that was my legislation for energy efficiency. And it was pretty amusing, too, because I called in, and those are one of, the, one of the good things you can do when you're a member of Congress, I called up Maytag and Frigidaire and all the other appliance manufacturers and said, gentlemen, I understand, and I had all the data from the national labs, I said, I understand that you could be X amount more energy efficient. And they said, oh, no, it'll be too expensive and cost jobs. Sound familiar? Just what all those ads on um, the Initiative 112 is saying now on television and elsewhere. That's the argument they always use. So we need to perk up and pay attention that, and we need to say, prove it. Well, they couldn't prove it, and I said, well, you're either with me or against me. I'm introducing legislation for appliance efficiency standards, and so, they decided to be with me, and we did it. And then I thought, well, how are the consumers going to know, you know, this one's more efficient than that one? And then we got into the whole labeling process, which was a massive undertaking in itself. Needless to say, all of those pieces of the omnibus bill, which was supported in a bipartisan way by 140 members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, and I'll tell you, the way I won the support of many of the Republicans was to argue the economics. And it just blew my mind. And I, oh, Al Gore was on my committee. And so I said, Al, I've got this bill, you know, I need you to co -so be a co-signer on here. And he said, oh, I don't know, you know, so he was not in any great rush. And... Then when he decided to get involved in climate change was when he got into the Senate, he said, well, we're going to include nuclear here. And I said, in my bill, because my bill would then, you know, move over to the Senate. And I said, sorry, that's a non-starter. No nuclear in my bill. And, um, and one of the things that I didn't complete is that in Rhode Island, we did have the town meetings, we did organize, the state was against us, the town was against us. It turned out that there were secret negotiations with the utility and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I couldn't find a lawyer to represent the people. So one of the things that I did was to organize an environmental law firm in the 1970s. Well, there weren't that many law firms at that time that knew environmental law, but we started the Conservation Law Foundation of Rhode Island. And one of the key things was that we were successful in stopping the nuke plant from getting built in Rhode Island. Uh, so Rhode Island has no nuke plants, but I will say it was quite, <laughs> quite an eye-opener when I got to Congress and they were discussing before my committee, what are we going to do with all this nuclear waste in the country? And they said, well, we should dispose of it in a regional way. And we've got, you know, um, X number of plants in Massachusetts right now. We've got some in Vermont. We've got, oh, we've got one in Connecticut. Hey, there are no nuke plants in Rhode Island, so maybe we should put the waste there. It's like, guys, over my dead body, that is not happening. But, you know, then they said, well, maybe we'll put it between the fault lines in the Atlantic. 
and having been married to an oceanographer who was a marine geologist and a marine biologist, I have this weakness for guys with double PhDs, what can I say? Um, he said, this is insanity, you know, you cannot do that. So um, I must admit, I want to zoom to the present moment so we can open it up for a little bit of questions. Um, fuel efficiency was also part of my bill. That did not pass. Um, when I got to Congress, people right away started saying, oh, the, the environmentalist. And I thought, man, I got to get some credentials in the business community. So um, I was invited to be a speaker to the Business Higher Education Forum with a Democratic colleague. And I happened to be sitting beside John Young, who was at that time the CEO of Hewlett Packard. And um, we're eating lunch, and I'm just new in Congress. And he turns to me and he says, man, I, I hate you politicians. And it was like, no. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, I just put together for President Reagan this whole study on competitiveness and the United States. And right now, it's sitting on a shelf gathering dust. And he said, it is a roadmap for us to be more competitive. And I thought, oh, give it to me. I, I love roadmaps. I'll get going on this and we'll implement it in Congress. So actually, that's what we started doing. And we formed the Competitiveness Caucus. And it was, once again, a bipartisan caucus where uh, once a month, we would invite the CEO in from a variety of different corporations like Merck Pharmaceuticals or DuPont to talk to Congress to say, here are our challenges, this is what we need fixed. So I had some of those business credentials, and that was what made it more possible for me to move legislation because I was able to discuss the cost benefit, the economics of any environmental initiative that I had in mind. So please keep that in mind. Um, if you were to try to say it's for the good of the world or it'll help the poor or anything soft and mushy like that, you wouldn't get a following. So I learned how to speak the economics and as was pointed out in my introduction, um, it helped me when I decided, I was invited to be on a board of an engineering firm here in, Bol in Boulder and I was on the board and these board members kept complaining that they never get good government contracts. And I said, well, what are you looking for? And they said, an EPA contract, you know, of some sort. And I said, well, have you tried? <laughs> well, they hadn't. And so I said, well, they said, no, all the Beltway bandits, all the big Cadmus and, you know, um, FIIC and all the others, they're the ones that get all the contracts. And I said, well, let's go there and offer our services as subcontractors. So that's what we did. Long story short, we got Cadmus to um, choose us as their subcontractor. And I just said, you know, um, I need to resign from the board, but I'd like to be an employee. And I'll get on the phone because I want to get corporations to reduce their greenhouse gases. Because if we move corporations, we move Congress. And we need national legislation. Well, they said, okay, fine. So that's what I did. And it was like dialing for dollars or something. And, you know, I didn't say, hi, I'm a former congresswoman, although some people did recognize my name. And I said, for example, I called Bank of America and I said, um, I'm calling on behalf of EPA and I'm wondering what you folks are doing with your greenhouse gases. And there was a long pause on the other end of the line and the fellow says, you know we're a bank, right? And I said, yes. And he, I said, well, don't you have lighting in your banks and heating and cooling? And he said, yes. And I said, then you are responsible for generating greenhouse gases. So when we talk about educating, that's what I realize I've been doing most of my life, educating people on how to get from point A to point B. 
And I put together a strategic plan that basically looked at the whole United States. I found out who was the chairman of the committee that related to climate, who was the chairman of the committee that related to energy, and then I focused on those states and focused on the largest corporations, and I went after those, and after I got Lockheed Martin and Target stores and Staples and Raytheon and Merck Pharmaceuticals, um, I called some of the staff people on the Hill. I said, look, when you're doing a science and tech hearing and you need some expert witnesses to talk about billions of dollars that they have saved by reducing their six greenhouse gases, then you will be able to persuade the other members of the committee. So at any rate, that was one of my devious um, efforts in trying to move these corporations. Now I'm happy to report that there are many more. There are in the end, there were 200, I cannot even keep track of how many now, but when Governor Jerry Brown held his meeting a couple of weeks ago, his gathering of the climate summit, the bottom line is right now there are 17 states in the United States, Colorado being one, that are part of this group that are committed to reducing greenhouse gases big time. These 17 states represent 40% of the entire US economy. And when you look at their return on investment, these 17 states have stronger economies than the other states in the United States. So there is an economic argument for you. And I'm not going to get into more of the economics of this because knowing some of the people in this audience, this is what you do for a living or have done for a living. You know all these numbers, you know these facts. What I am is a strategist. How do we get from here to there? My answer is what I was doing when I could have been at the climate summit. And that is, I had once again been listening to a bunch of guys whining about how bad things are in Washington and the Republican Party. And these were mostly all Republicans that were complaining. And then I called the president of this group because um, they meet regularly in Washington, and I'm always on the phone. And I said, well, you know, rather than complain, why don't we do something about this? And he said, great idea, Claudine. Um, why don't you organize former members of Congress that are Republicans and speak up? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, is this really what I have to do? I'd much rather be focused on my climate work. Um, but... I thought long and hard about that, and I will tell you that I believe that this election, 2018, is the most important election of my lifetime, and probably yours too. And here's why I believe that. And a while ago, I was uh, contacted by BuzzFeed, the media folks, and they said, we're calling to get your take on um, who you think would be a good Republican candidate for 2020. And I said, well, I have to stop you right there because I am not interested in 2020. What? And I said, I am interested in this election happening November 6, 2018, because I think it is infinitely more important at this moment in time. And I said, do you realize that only 30% of the American people vote in the off year? And that's when members of Congress and many senators have the opportunity to being thrown out or elected in. And so he did change the trajectory of his story happily, but I think that it's important for all of us in this room, and I hope you will, tell everybody that you know, young and old alike, that this is the most important election because this is a ramp up to 2020. And any of you that have worked at EPA, and you know, I've been watching different segments of our government be demolished. And I have said for some time now, I am very concerned about a recession because when you look at this tax cut that was passed, 
In addition to what are called tax extenders, Mitch McConnell knows all about that because he extended taxes to anybody who owns a racehorse and they can deduct all of their expenses. And then you add on to that the budgets that they just barely pass over the past couple of years, which is a real deficit buster. And you add on to that the earmarks that the Republicans said they weren't going to do and on top of that, you add the tariffs. OMG, not looking good. So, I hate to bring you this kind of bad news, but I also want to give you hope and inspire you to understand that we have about 34 days left before the election. And if you were just to focus on getting out the vote or working for one of the candidates that you believe in, and last night when I was interviewed, I was no holds barred. I said, these hearings that are going on are another indication of why we need more women in Congress. When I got elected to Congress, <laughs> thank you. When I got elected and I'm looking through the budget, looking for waste, fraud, and abuse and where we can cut, um, and keep in mind it was the Science Research and Technology Committee, I looked at health research. Much to my horror, the research for women's health was 13%, and the rest was for men. And I thought, wait a minute, women are half the population. It should at least be 50-50. And then I thought, well, women have issues with pregnancy, with menopause, with whole broad spectrum of things. How could it be just 13%? Well, needless to say, once I got elected in Rhode Island, there was a plethora of women who just paraded in one after another. A woman who was 72 years old, she said to me, Claudine, I always thought I would depend on my husband's social security. He just died. I found out that I can't get it. And I was new to Congress. I said, don't worry. We'll figure this out. I'll, I'll check it. I'm sure that somebody's giving you wrong information. I could not believe it. Well, I had my staff check it out, and then I went to Washington, and we had a women's caucus, and I said, ladies, what's up with this? They said, oh, yeah, that's a gap that's, you know, we haven't been able to get rid of. And I said, well, let's try again. You know, let's do this. It's only because you have a cadre of women who think about immigrants and children being separated from their families that, and not just women, I mean, I would like to assume that all the men in this room also use your feminine side and are very concerned about some of these things that many of the men in Congress now are not concerned with. So we need to change it up. I was there for 10 years, and to me, when guys talk to me like I was in the military, or the, I think, you know, I did my service for my country for those 10 years. But every single day, I continue to do my service for the world because this group that we formed with former members, Republican members of Congress is called Republicans for Integrity. And I ask you all to please Google that and look it up. And um, Republicans for Integrity has a, only a select number of tabs, but it's Republicans criticizing Republicans. And I'm urging people to send this to some of the Republicans you don't feel comfortable talking to. You know, the, the cousin that's at your Thanksgiving dinner and you just like, oh, I'm not gonna discuss politics with him. This website, pretty much says what the Republicans are doing wrong. And on climate, 100% wrong. The whole tab on that website for climate has to do with the cost of inaction. And so we have tallied up all of the cost of the forest fires in California, the flooding in the east, the hurricanes, tornadoes, and everything else. So that is a resource for all of you to use as a tool to enlist um, any Republicans that are thoughtful. But my bottom line, and that of the other Republicans that are working with me, Republicans for Integrity, is it's time to move the Republican majority out. 
And the reason being is that they are not going to get it or understand until they suffer a major loss. But right now, they are wrong on climate, which is the single most important issue in our lifetime. And they are wrong on gun control because they refuse to take any leadership action on gun control. And I will say that Orrin Hatch, I, worked, I got word when I was in Congress that he was going to unravel Title IX to the Education Act. Well, that enables young women to have athletic scholarships to get a college education. I tried to stop him, he said no. So I dug in my heels and I realized that Title IX also related to discrimination against the disabled, against minorities, and against the elderly. So we introduced the Civil Rights Restoration Act. We passed it in the House. We passed it in the Senate. Ronald Reagan vetoed it. Grassroots made the difference. All of the women's organizations got moving and marching and lobbying, and we turned it around. We overrode a presidential veto, which is a very rare thing. The reason that that happened was because all of you, the people, were engaged. We are the government, like it or not. And when you figure, oh, I'm not going to get involved, we got what we've got now. There are two great women running in Colorado for the U.S. Congress, and I hope that you have the opportunity to vote for them. Ken Buck is being opposed by uh, Karen McCormick that I am helping. And then in the South, Scott Tipton, another guy who has 100% rating with the American Conservative Union and 100% with the NRA. And when you have 100% with the NRA, that means you are not moving on any proposal. So um, that's basically all I wanted to share with you. We're all in this together. We all have got to work our tails off, only 34 more days. And now I'd love to hear from all of you. Thank you. Claudine, when I created that uh, flyer for you, I, I, I created a second headline and it said how climate solutions can boost our economy and save taxpayers money. Yes. Uh, well, now, I wrote this, uh, uh, not you, uh -huh. but I still hope you might be able sure. to argue on that front because one of the reasons we invited you mm -hmm. uh, was to get ammunition um, or, or let's use a less uh, belligerent term. That's fine. Arguments to talk with our Republican neighbors yep. to convince them that um, uh, fighting against climate change is not at all incompatible with conservative values. So if you could say right. a few wo more words on that. And I'm not going to take away from Grant Couch, who will be your speaker, who will itemize these He'll things be in for Boulder, you. Yes. But, but I will elaborate a little bit on that, Martin. And let me begin by saying that if you're talking to some of your Republican neighbors about climate, you can start with asking them, well, are you a fiscal conservative? And they'll probably say yes. And say, well, do you know that it has cost us, and I am, my brain is a little scrambled after watching television for eight hours, um, so I don't recall the number, but on the website, those are the tools that all of you can be armed with, that it is billions of dollars that taxpayers are having to pony up in order to deal with the impacts of climate change. Now, if they say, well, you know, granted this was the most rain we've gotten ever, you need to let them know this is the beginning of more rain. So you need to think about your pocketbook and how this will affect you. Now, one of the things that is also important to note that FEMA just said that more of their money is going, or more of their uh, reimbursements are going to have to be picked up by the states. 
So that's telling you they say they want to cut federal involvement in the federal budget. So they cut FEMA and they say, okay, guys, you're on your own. That is not right. And I also heard today that um, they were looking to find more money from the CDC and cancer research in order to pay for some of the expenses of these disasters. One great um, thing I took away from Chuck Kutcher's yeah. talk from Enwell, mm -hmm. uh, he says, I hate the term the new normal. What we should really be calling yeah. it is the new abnormal. Yeah. Uh, and it's very hard financially or otherwise to deal with something abnormal if yeah. it repeats year after year. Well, the reason that I translated all of the climate info, I could have touched on 10 different aspects of climate and made the case of how our economies will boom on the website. But Republicans claim to be fiscally responsible, and when they read these numbers, they'll be blown away at the cost of inaction. And it's like saying to them, look, do you have insurance on your home? Yes, of course I do. Well, we have no insurance on our planet. And this is what's happening. You know, Mother Earth is burning, or she's crying, or whatever, but the damage is very costly. And, and speaking of insurance, uh, one of the big uh, menaces that we face is that insurance uh, or industry will wise up that oh, yeah. entire regions on the coastline, yep. Florida, Gulf of Mexico, started. will yes. no longer be insurable, yeah. in which case uh, you can't get a mortgage. You can't get a mortgage Correct. for 30 years if the insurance doesn't think they'll recover their money. So uh, this might unravel really, really quickly. And again, uh, fiscal responsibility doesn't really uh, even touch that. Right. Well, on that same website, most of the page is dedicated to the cost of the various impacts of climate, and it's titled The Cost of Doing Nothing. But if you go to the very bottom, if I recall correctly, it, there is a study there that says something like, ooh, I'm terrible, I don't want to state the number, but trillions of dollars could benefit our economy if we were to go full force ahead. And I had really hoped, you know, because when Al Gore was the vice president, that this was going to be like a moonshot, you know, and I said, come on, I, I did the road map, and now all we have to do is implement this, let's get going. And so, needless to say, I was very disappointed, and then I went, you know, to um, other administrations and former colleagues in the House and Senate, handing this to them, saying, take it as your own, but let's move, let's move, and now I've concluded it's up to all of you. I mean, there is no good reason to elect any Republicans from Colorado to the House or the Senate. No good reason. I, and I've been watching them because I care about the Congress. I've really been watching how they're dismantling EPA, having had cancer, you know, twice in my life and getting it from a coal-fired plant. I left that part out. I grew up in Pittsburgh and my job as a little girl every day was to dust the house. So every day. And my dad died of lung cancer, and he was a non-smoker, and my mother got asthma, and then she died of lung cancer. So I figure the good Lord's keeping me around for a purpose, and I'm going to maximize every day, because um, even when they told me I had it the second time, uh, they said, you have two different types of cancer, and you should get your things in order. That was 19 years ago. So I just don't take directions very well from <laughs> some folks. Can't believe everything you hear. At one point in my life, I want there to be the option in my head of, oh, do I really want to vote Democrat or do I want to vote Republican? I can't decide. Yes. I think they're, you know, this guy's got, I think he would bring a lot of change in this area, and he, she would bring a lot of change in this area. Can the GOP be restored to 
actually being working for the people. Well, here's and my sorry, yeah, I go don't ahead. mean to interrupt. And like, how can I, as a citizen, brand new in politics and um, really interested in renewable energy, how can I contribute to that? Well, I think. Um, one of the most important things that you and everybody here can do is to really sock it to any of the candidates and say, quit being so partisan. And I don't have near-term hope for the Republican Party. And honestly, I'm not, what I'm doing now between now and the election is not fun for me. It is incredibly stressful and I hate it and I hate paying attention to a lot of this nonsense because ever since I left Congress, I've focused on climate policy. That's it. And I've been able to move the needle because of my focus. But because democracy is on the ropes right now, I thought, wow, hey, I ought to use my position to leverage something. Well, that group that I told you about in Washington, D.C., they watch politics. I don't. So I've been listening and learning from them. And they are all, and they're Republicans and some are libertarians. And they basically, I mean, are saying the Republican Party needs to get slapped upside the head to lose big time, have this be a wake up call, not a, just a blue wave, but a blue tsunami. And then maybe, just maybe, some good people will start running and be more collaborative. Now, I will tell you that when I decided I was gonna go do this effort, I went over to Nancy Pelosi's office, and she was a friend of mine, and we served together, and we always worked in a bipartisan fashion. And I said, you know, Nancy, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna you know, basically be criticizing Republicans, but do me a favor. I said, don't do the same thing that the Republicans have been doing, and that is closing your hearings, ramming things through, um, and not cooperating. You know, please be the model of bipartisan collaboration for the purpose of problem solving in the best interest of all the people. And the answer was yes. Now, you know, I don't know if that's a, a female thing or what, but, you know, I know Ron Wyden, who's still there, and a number of the other Democrats, and they're really collaborative. They re and so I don't know if it's just in some of the Democratic blood that they are kinder and gentler, and I don't know who some of these Republicans are now because they're horrible, you know? So... I don't think we're gonna get a time real soon for you to be able to say, mm, do I vote Democrat or Republican? That's not the environment we're in. We have gotten so entrenched that now we have to declare war and go after those Republicans because they are the bad guys, no question about it. On all the issues that look toward the future, they're setting us back toward the past and we are becoming more and more vulnerable internationally. You know, Russia's only the tip of the iceberg. And I studied Mandarin, you know, I've been to China a number of times. It, for us to do these tariffs with China, you know, but look who we have in the White House. And I don't wanna say it's our fault because I won't take any blame for that because I worked my tail off in that last election, so. Larson has to ask the honorary question because he's my buddy from way back when. We knew one another when I was in Congress and he was, and still is, the champion for all things good related to climate and renewables. So thanks, Ron, for having me here tonight. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> you deserve it and more. I followed uh, Jerry Brown's activities last week. Or yes. Week. He is, I think, established the first goal for any state, maybe even a country, for going carbon negative. And, Correct. And I'm working primarily in carbon negativity. Can, can you suggest um, how we get other states to do what, what has happened in, 
in California, and he did that as an executive. It's not yet law. Is that camera still on? <laughs> you can always edit, but yes. Okay. Um, the way we get it in Rhode Island is we elect Gerald, Jared Polis because his opponent will take us backwards. No question about that. No question. No matter how many cities, that Aspen, Boulder, Colorado. or whatever. Yeah, Colorado. Yeah. Who so. needs such a goal? California has the goal, but Colorado could get such a goal with the election of Jared Polis, I believe. And with all the other cities and all the fracking that's going on, you know, the, the anti-fracking folks have about had it. And they're fighting against, we're fighting for climate neutral. We need to work together because we share the same outcome. If I could just pick up on the word carbon. Yeah. I want, I, I want to see us stop using the word carbon neutral and start talking carbon negativity. So after 2045, Brown says California can be, after that year, no more carbon going in, only carbon coming out. Yeah. I would like to ask you a, a question of what you think of the proposal by Jim Baker and George Schultz and and uh, Martin Feldstein and others for this uh, revenue neutral carbon tax with equal per capita dividends <clears throat> and uh, what you think the prospects for that might be if, if uh, that type of Republican ever comes, comes back to the fore. Okay, well, um, the guy who's running the organization that enlisted Jim Baker, with whom I served and had a great relationship with, and George Schultz, Ted Halstead runs that organization. He used to work for me on my staff, and I'm happy to report that another staff person is heading up um, the Environmental Integrity Project, and their focus is to kill coal plants. And another friend of mine has been working, I mean, staff person with Jeremy Rifkin moving toward carbon neutral communities and another staff person has been working with NRDC and he worked to get AB 32 in California passed along with George Schultz. So my guys are all over the place and we're all focused on climate. Now, uh, what do I think of their proposal? Um, I'm also on the Citizens Climate Lobby Board and they have a proposal that's a little different. And my huge frustration is we need to work together. Let's quit nitpicking and come to a compromise because the more divided we are, the less chance we have of getting anything through. So that's one part job description for the environmental community to support a carbon fee and dividend approach, some, some structure like that. Will we get it in this Congress? Never, never. In case you haven't been following this, and if you go to my climate page on Republicans for Integrity, you will see over the last three years, Congressman Scalise, has introduced a resolution. Now understand it's not a law, it's just a, saying the sense of the House is that any kind of carbon fee and dividend will hurt the economy. Overwhelming partisan support for that out of the Republicans, except for my buddy Carlos Corbello from uh, Miami, who is the co-founder of the um, Climate Solutions Caucus. He's trying his best, but the reality is he is this much of a minority. And the Republicans have decided, and people say, why are Republicans against climate? Well, the bottom line is follow the money. In politics, you always want to do that. So all of you guys basically had the, the correct answer. And on the climate tab on the website, we prove it. We show that the largest recipients of money from the fossil fuel industry is going overwhelmingly to all the Republicans. 
So there you have it. And no longer called the GOP the grand old party, it's the grand oil party. So um, yeah, keep an eye on that. What? Yeah. How will the future Supreme Court relate to our climate issues? You know, what, what will happen? I mean, there are some incredible cases pending and so forth, so what will, yeah. what will happen? Um, I think that decisions that will come down the line related to climate will not stand a good chance. And that is because I think any decision coming before Judge Kavanaugh may be tainted by his sense of obligation to the Republican majority that stood, was steadfast in support of him. Um, it saddens me because I, am, I feel very patriotic having spent those 10 years in Congress. I am very concerned about the demolition of democracy. I'm very angry with the voters that they're not doing more. And if you have ever traveled outside the United States or even read about the international news and know what's going on in Hungary or Poland or anywhere, many of these other countries, you would understand that the attack on the press is dangerous. The, the single party rule is dangerous and the self-righteousness and the lying and the maneuvering is very, very dangerous. So, you know, I just got an email from the Citizens Climate Lobby colleague saying, Claudine, sorry you are missing the meeting tonight. And I said, I'm speaking to voters and to people who are very engaged in energy. And we need to understand this is it, folks. We need to work hard. Now, the one hope is, you know, let's just look at worst case scenario. He does get confirmed. We better have a Democratic House and Senate so that we can change the laws. Because once the law is in place and leaves nothing to interpretation, the Supreme Court will have to go along with the law. So there, there is that sliver of hope, but we have to use it. I'm a recent transplant from Wisconsin. Welcome. And uh, oh, thank you. Um, I had a question about nuclear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I know there's a big difference between our existing technology and I see lots of things about second, third, fourth generation nuclear. Um, I don't, I was kind of curious about your connection to scientists and what they say about these technologies that aren't being implemented at any scale. And if you're opposed to nuclear in totality, um, the example that I have is in Wisconsin, we've had a pretty huge uh, investment away from coal into natural gas. And I don't know if they had that option technologically to do it with nuclear instead. And, you know. Good question. That kind of topic. Um, so I can only, I can't speak to the decision making in Wisconsin, but I can say that um, I became a quick student of nuclear back in the 80s. And when I got to Congress, I learned pretty quickly that nobody had figured out what to do with the waste. So call it common sense but it just seemed wrong to me to be generating a waste that we hadn't figured out what to do with yet. And actually, uh, the Clinch River Breeder Reactor in Tennessee was one of my greater accomplishments because we killed it. And that was to basically take some of the, nuclear, the uranium and create fuel uh, out of it. Um, and the, the argument I used was that it was over budget and taxpayers were stuck with the bill to the tune of $8 billion, and that was not responsible. And it was supposed to be a pub, public-private partnership. So um, that, you know, sort of had created my mindset. But I've had a number of different folks say, you know, they have smaller nuclear reactors now, and, you know, there's this and that. 
I haven't researched that, so I really don't have a position on the newer nuclear options. But to me, one of the biggest arguments against nuclear was the cost. And they say, oh, well, the cost is because there are so many regulations. Excuse me, you remove those regulations, we have a meltdown, and populations die, you know? So don't give me that regulation argument. But I think that um, there may be a role for it. I don't know. Uh, if I first can say something about the cost issue, uh, at present, nuclear is simply not competitive. Right. It's priced itself out of the market. Uh, it's just way beyond what anybody would want to pay for it. So I agree. I mean, but it was that way back in the 80s, too, all the way up to the present moment. So I would like to just add a footnote to the discussion a few minutes ago about uh, the regulatory impacts on nuclear power economics. And the, the industry complained vociferously in the, in, the, in the 1980s, and they had good reason to complain because nuclear power was experiencing negative learning. Each plant yeah. that was successive plant that was built was more expensive than the than the one that was built before. Right. And they said if we could only be more like the French. Okay. The the problem with that argument at that time was there's no data on the cost of nuclear power plants in in France. But shortly after the turn of the century, electricity to France uh, declassified all the informa cost information on, on nuclear power in France. Yeah. And about 10 years ago, Arnulf Grubler at Yassa analyzed the cost trend in, uh, in France, and the result of the analysis was there was negative learning in France as well as in the United States. The only difference was the negative learning rate was not quite as fast as in the United States, but there was negative learning nevertheless. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, in the summer of 1985, what I, which I understand was when you were in Congress, yes. uh, I was uh, hired for the most exotic and um, enlightening project I ever worked on. Basically, it was to develop a, a seed or a kernel to create a Clean Soils Act that would complement the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water mm. Act, and eliminate a Clean Air Act standard from creating a Clean Soils Act problem. Wow. Okay. And it was put together by Jim Baker, uh, not the Politico. No. Out there. He was the EPA the toxicologist yeah, I know for the uh, Hazardous Waste Management Division of Region 8. And the question I have is, do you know anything about this and what happened no. to it? No. Sadly, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Really? And even though I was on the science committee in 85 and we introduced the Global Warming Act later and it had a, has a um, component of it um, on agriculture, I've not heard of this. It sounds pretty phenomenal. So you don't know what happened to it either, huh? No, but I, I have a copy of what we created and it, it's very compelling. And it's still relevant. And it's, it's getting more relevant all the time. Well, then yeah. we need a new administration because yeah. then, I mean, yeah. in the 90s, I was invited over to the Department of Agriculture, and I'll never forget this forum in 91 where there were 20 farmers sitting around a table, all men, and little old me. And at the time, I was teaching up at Harvard, and so they had name tags, you know, John Brown, soybean farmer, Claudine Schneider, and I, Harvard, oh my God, you know. So I took the name tag away right away and I said, I'm not here to talk about climate change. I'm here to listen about climate change. And I will tell you that without an exception, all 20 of those people that participated in this round table all said, hey, I'm a farmer, something's weird, this isn't right. Yeah, we believe climate change is a problem. Now, how those farmers changed from then to now when the conditions have gotten worse, yeah. I don't get it. But those are people I'm also after to turn around. Well, so, well very, yeah. very interestingly, uh, I might add that all of the groups that I contacted, including uh, industry, were yeah. very interested in supporting and promoting this. Wow. 
Okay, when I have nothing more to do, I'll call you and let's see where we can get that. <laughs> well, I don't really have a working expertise or understanding around climate issues and, and things like that. So what advice would you have for someone like me who's passionate about these things in the broadest sense of I know it's good for humanity, but I don't really have kind of a working knowledge of this, like uh -huh. in terms of being involved, in terms of like that process of being an active citizen, even though I'm not necessarily a climate expert or involved in the science field. Um, just kind of your thoughts on advice for me. Policymakers usually make decisions based on money. And that is why polluters, oh, let's take the auto industry, for example, and you have all know about the uh, plans to roll back fuel efficiency for automobiles, which was another piece of my legislation which was, did not go through. Um, that is insane absolutely going backwards for several reasons, but think of the consumers, because that's who Congress represents. We represent all of you. Don't we want to help you save money? Yes. So if your car can go further on 10 gallons of, of gas, isn't that better than having to go only three miles on 10, you know? So that is insane. Um, I think that one of the things that you could do if you were so inclined to get together with a group um, is get together with the Citizens Climate Lobby. Of course, they are singularly focused on a carbon fee and dividend, but I happen to be multifaceted in my solutions approach. And since I mentioned I look at cost, I am always pushing energy efficiency because it's the least cost approach for the maximum return on the dollar. And after that, wind or solar, either one, or, you know, there are other options depending on where you live, but certainly here in Colorado for the home, solar is a no-brainer. And um, a number of years ago, I was asked to head up a group, basically like a trade association of 30 of the world's largest solar manufacturers. And what um, I thought, geez, well, okay, I'm the president of this group. I should have solar on my house. So I had them come over and do an analysis. And they looked at my bills, and they looked at me, and they walked around the house, and they just laughed. And I said, what? And they said, you don't use any energy. And it's like, yes. <laughs> That's been my intention all along. I've maximized my energy efficiency. I've got energy efficiency appliances and equipment in my home. And just being little old me, I don't use much energy at all. You know, I have lots of sunlight, don't turn on the lights until late at night, so it's all good. Another question? Just thought about the auto industry and like a different approach to marketing electric cars rather than making it about climate change making it about basically what Tesla is doing, you know, making it about performance, safety, cost efficiency, increased storage capacity. You know, there's like a list of about 20 different things that I don't yes. think most Americans even realize makes these vehicles better. And I don't think, I mean, it'd just be nice to see some kind of nationwide marketing campaign, billboards, anything that could just at least let people know that these vehicles are superior. Who would pay for it? I don't know. Maybe some billionaire. <laughs> well, Democratic billionaire? I don't know. Yeah, Somebody there are that's a lot really... of those guys around. Yeah. Um, I agree with you completely. I've read something recently about um, electric cars getting more visibility, PR, that sort of thing. And um, Basically, it's up to the auto industry, you know, to choose which cars they advertise. And since the American public continues to buy these CRVs or SUVs, you know, we need to tamp them down. I had a pretty embarrassing experience not too long ago. I was meeting a friend to go for a hike, and I was trying to park my car, which is not a Prius or not the you know, the most, it's old, but um, 
and there was this giant SUV on either side of me. So I saw my friend, and she was standing there waiting, and I said, oh, sorry to keep you waiting, but oh, these giant SUVs, I couldn't even fit in between them to get a parking spot. And I said, look at that big thing. She said, oh, my dad just bought that for me. <laughs> oh, well. I, uh, I submitted a concept to a group, a think tank in the Beltway called Third Way. And, oh, yeah, I've um, heard of them. Yeah, and, uh, and, and what I was describing was the importance of governing to the middle and that, um, and that the, the nation needed what I called a, a civic uh, intervention yeah. and that there ought to be uh, 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 like a, a new way or a new set of rules on, on governance that would, that would encourage governing to the middle. And, and the way I described it, it was like a point system. If you, if you were the party in control, the more that you uh, govern to the middle, you would essentially get more points or more value. And the less you did, you would, you would lose value. And, you know, anyway, so I, I just wanted to throw that out, civic intervention, and, it, and then, then we, uh, then it all blew up and we had the nuclear uh, uh, option uh, and so forth, so it all fizzled. Uh, but I, I wanted to say that um, China, it's not an accident that China leads in solar uh, uh, today. That was for them a moonshot goal and it took 10 years or more mm -hmm. for that to happen. Um, and it's, uh, it, uh, I, I'm a solar guy and I recognize that we are at a, an important cusp with storage, with battery storage and that uh, we're in a position where we could seize that moonshot goal to be the world leader in storage. And yes. I also believe that uh, it won't be long, it might be five years or 10 years before uh, solar will look like an incomplete product without storage. Uh, and and hmm. as will wind, you know, renewable uh -huh. energy will look like an incomplete product, just like uh, off-grid now looks like an incomplete product without a net meter uh -huh. connected to the grid. And uh, in the future, renewable energy will look like an incomplete product without storage. And we could have a moonshot goal to be the dominating world leader in storage. Well, um I love the way you frame that. This sort of gets back to this gentleman's thing of, you know, how you frame a message is critical and how, how you promote it. Um, I think that that is a great framing of a goal. And um, let us hope that Jared Polis, not hope, we can't hope, we've got to work. Let us work to get Jared Polis elected. And then we go and say, let's make Colorado the epicenter for a moonshot on batteries. And he'll understand that. I've talked to him many times, you know, he'll get that. And let's, let's set up a task force, Mr. Governor, and you can volunteer to be on the task force. I'll help you out. Although I told him I want to be on the Public Utilities Commission, so keep that in mind. <laughs> So uh, my question to you all, actually, is have you had a chance to see the new Michael Moore movie? Oh, I can't um, wait to see it. It's absolutely Maybe this phenomenal. Weekend. Yeah, and I saw it twice just to make sure that I could say whether or not Obama had or had not had Flint water, drank it. So it's, it, you know, he leaves no stone unturned and he really does kind of bash both parties. But, um, and he says that both parties are responsible for our current president and uh, when you see the movie, you'll see why yeah. he's come to that assessment. And it's quite fascinating. And my last question to all of us is, could a multi-party system work in the United States? Well, um, it's, you know, always nice to fantasize about what if, but man, we can't do that now. We've got two parties. Anytime you vote for a third party candidate, we end up losing. I mean, if that hasn't been evident, by now, you're not paying attention. So, Democrat or Republican, pick the lesser of two evils if that's how you're perceiving it. But um, given what's going on in this country now, I'm just thrilled with the two women that are running for Congress that have the guts to do this. 
because I'm thinking, geez, this is so much more expensive than when I was running. And oh my God, these people are so nasty. And now many of them are carrying guns. So I have a whole lot of admiration for you know, some of these candidates. But let's show our appreciation by working for them. And one more thing about Flint, Michigan. Bruno Mars gave a million dollars to Flint, Michigan. I know that because I'm a fan. Okay. <laughs> as, as, since we're giving out recommendations, uh, Beth, um, I just, uh, for all the fans of uh, horror movies or um, <laughs> Chainsaw Massacre, so I have another no. one. Uh, Jane Meyer, uh, or Mayer, Dark Money. Oh, yes. uh, and it outlines um, uh, one of the reasons why the, uh, your father's Republican Party is not today's Republican Party, because it's been completely undermined uh, by think tanks uh, funded by the most outrageous people uh, on earth, all billionaires with totally weird ideas to the right of Genghis Khan. I mean, I'm, so, I'm contemplating writing a book called Drek, how it's all <laughs> Drek. garbage what comes yeah. out of these circles. And it was considered garbage uh, way into the 80s. Mm. Nobody took these ideas seriously because they are Drek. But the, I, the thing is, is that their ideas are a bribe for the Republican members of Congress. If you pick up on eliminating Roe vo versus Wade, 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 whatever, it's been a long day, um, then I'll give you money. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what it's all. So speaking of dark money in politics, there is an organization, it's also on the website, I'm trying to give you all tools, it's called issue1.org. Issue one is getting rid of the dark money in campaigns. And who's part of this? Former members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, and we've got a few governors too. I'm not running that this is run out of Washington DC, it's a big operation. And we just released a report on leadership PAC monies. So if you give money to a campaign, you expect that money to be used to run for office. Well, Duncan Hunter from California, you probably heard, used $250,000 to go to Disneyland, to eat at fancy restaurants, to take his family. No, this is not how the Federal Election Commission should be monitoring this. So, issue1.org. One other website I want to give you that's the most important one of the night, aside from my own, of course, um, is votesmart.org. I had a young guy do some work at my house recently, and I said, hey, are you registered to vote? I'm relentless. I ask everybody I encounter, grocery store, wherever. He said, well, no, not really. I, you know, family, and I know that whole story. Young 30, 40 year olds are very busy just staying alive. So I said, you have to vote in this election. Give me your email address. So I emailed him two things. I said, here's how you register online to vote made it easy for him. And I said, and here, you go to votesmart.org. You put in your zip code, and then up will come who's running for Congress, who's running for the governor, blah, blah, blah. And it also, after you look at positions, it tells you the ratings by women's organizations, the NRA, the chamber, whatever. You can get all that info. And the other, you know, if you have limited time, look at the financials. And it's very interesting, you follow the money. I mean, the oil money going to all those Republicans, and those are on the other website. But votesmart.org is the best, you know, one-stop shopping to do your homework on who you want to vote for. That's an excellent suggestion, really. Um, uh, at your time at Harvard, you might have met uh, Alex Kesar. He studied uh, the uh, American uh, voting system, the history of it, and describes it as arcane and created uh, by incumbents. 
Um, the United States has one of the most uh, dispersed uh, voting systems with uh, maybe four and a half thousand districts all making up their own rules uh, with election commissions that are um, partisanly led by the incumbents. So yeah. um, we need tools like votesmart.org to, uh, to actually maximize our impact in this in this maze of purposefully made difficult um, uh, decisions. Once again, I'll, I'll thank uh, Claudine Schneider for giving us her time. And thank Martin, you. I want to I want to thank you for your organizational skills. I want to thank Ron Larson for a lifetime of commitment to these issues. I want to thank. Steve Stevens for your commitment to making a difference in this whole arena that we've been talking to. And some of the others of you, I don't even, may not know, but for all I know, you've been working harder and faster than one could imagine. So whatever you're doing, and I mean, it was hard for me to say in 2016 after the last election, okay, I'm backing off from climate now. I'm gonna focus 100% of my time on the elections, whatever you're doing now, 34 days can afford your absence and your singular focus on getting some good people elected. And then we can get to this gentleman's nirvana, which I too am hoping for, but we've got to start by electing a whole lot more Democrats. And once they get in, we bring these new proposals to them, the moonshots and, and some of the campaign and communication ideas, because they have a platform already. And we are there to act as support. So thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. So thank you very much.